First Timothy chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. I want to speak to you this morning on the theme, the exemplary life of a good servant of Christ Jesus. The exemplary life of a good servant of Christ Jesus. I am not also happy with the sound. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's read verses 11 to 16. Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Let's pray. Lord, this is your word. And we ask that you would bless your word, that our listening and our hearing of it will result into belief. We pray that the Holy Spirit of God, God himself, will speak to our hearts and that there will be change for those of us who hear it today. So we pray that we will be brought closer to Christ-likeness this morning. For that's what your word does, is to bring us to Christ. And may we draw to him, and that we can be more and more like him. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Timothy chapter, 1, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, if you were to just read it carefully, you would notice that Paul commands Timothy with 11 exhortations or commands. If somebody speaks to you and gives you 11 commands or exhortations, you will know that they mean business, and this is serious. You better pay attention. Now, these commands are given within the context of false teaching. So far, we have seen that uh, repetition of false teachers and false teaching in First Timothy. But not only are they given in the context of false teaching, but these commands are also given within the context of Timothy's ministry, which was a teaching ministry. Paul told Timothy of the prediction made by the Holy Spirit in chapter 4 verse 1, that in later times some will fall away from the faith. And the falling, as we have seen, is caused by the act of paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And I said as we went through verses 1 to 5 that Paul is saying that those who fall for this false teaching are responsible because they pay attention, they devote themselves to such teachings. And that's how people fall for false teaching. People will fall for man-made religions that disregard God and his clear truth. Now, Timothy's duty as a good servant of Christ was to point out this error to the brethren. We saw that in verse 6, where Paul says, in pointing out these things uh, to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. By so doing, Timothy will also prove to be a good servant of Christ Jesus who is nourished on the words of faith and of the sound doctrine. But as we saw last week, before Timothy can teach others, he himself needed to be nourished, needed to, be, needed to reject false teaching, and he needed to discipline himself for the purpose of of godliness. You can go and look at verse 6 all the way to verse 10. You will see that Timothy, I mean Paul addresses Timothy on that godliness. Disciplining yourself 
for the purpose of godliness. Now, that brings us to our text here this morning. And you would see in verse 11 of our text that Paul reiterates Timothy's teaching ministry with two commands. Prescribe and teach these things. Timothy, your ministry at Ephesus is to teach and to prescribe what I bring to you or what you have heard from God's word. Now, what are these things that Timothy was to prescribe and teach? Well, that's looking back to verses 1 to 10, pointing out error and teaching people to reject false teaching and also a discipline for the purpose of godliness is what Timothy was to prescribe and teach at Ephesus. Just to remind you again of the command to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness and just to make emphasis on that because we need that as believers daily. That the Apostle Paul said that godliness, the discipline for the purpose of godliness is profitable for all things because it holds promise for the present life right now while we're still alive and for the life to come when we will spend eternity with God. And he made a contrast between that discipline and a bodily discipline which Paul says it only profit for a little while, only for this world. So if you were to choose between bodily discipline and discipline for the purpose of godliness, Paul says choose Discipline for the purpose of godliness because it will be eternal, it will profit you eternally. And to stress his point, Paul told Timothy in verse 9 that the statement found in verse 8, which is godliness profit, Paul says is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. And because of that, the Apostle Paul and his colleagues continue to labor and strive for that godliness. So that's where we were last week. Striving and laboring for the purpose of godliness should be our endeavor. So now we come to this text where Paul tells Timothy, prescribe and teach these things. And when you look at those two commands, these are strong commands. These are strong terms. To prescribe means to give orders about what must be done. And to teach means to give instructions. So both terms assume Timothy must exercise teaching authority. These are words that carry with them such a strong authority. However, with these commands given to Timothy, there was one potential hindrance that Timothy had to overcome in order for people to take his orders and instructions seriously. If Timothy is going to be listened to, if people will listen to Timothy's instructions and orders, there is one potential problem or hindrance that he would need to overcome. And here is the problem. Timothy was a young man. Timothy was a youth. We see this in verse 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness. So Timothy is at an age where it may not be easy for him to prescribe or to teach, to give orders and instructions because he did not have the expected age that was expected in that culture. And now the question is, how would Timothy earn the respect of the people he's ministering to? How would Timothy be able to earn the respect in this congregation so that he can stand and prescribe and teach these things that Paul says Timothy was to take care of? Well, he's going to have to overcome this potential problem. Now, he cannot change the fact that he's a young man. He will still remain young. But there is one thing that Timothy can actually do which will earn him respect from those who might despise him. And what we are going to look at 
fear this morning, you will notice that it does not only apply to young ministers or young men, but it also applies to all ministers. It also applies to all people who would stand and minister God's word. All ministers of God's word are to lead by example. And that's what we are going to see. That's how Timothy can end the respect to stand and prescribe and teach in this church. is if he was going to lead an exemplary lifestyle. As the aged Apostle Paul often said, imitate me for I imitate Christ. So one can be an old minister and still fail to be an example to believers. So we could look at that and say, yes, age earns you some respect, but are you an exemplary man? Are you an exemplary minister? Or maybe to speak to all believers here, because we are all called to stand and prescribe and instruct in the matters of God's word. Do we stand and preach that word with exemplary lifestyles? You see, that matters when you are going to stand and preach or share the truth of God's word. So to Timothy, Paul says in verse 12, let no one look down on your youthfulness. Now let's put the youthfulness in some context here and perspective. The word youthfulness here was applied to everyone under the age of 40 years. So you can see that this is really pushed in that first culture. Up to 40 years. So if you were 40 then, you would still be regarded as a young man, as a youth. which tells you that this sermon is going to speak also to the young people in our presence. And this is the group I want to pay attention to as well this morning. You see, we often think that young people need to grow to a certain age before they can begin serving the Lord. But young people, I'm going to address you this morning just to let you know that you start serving the Lord at that age where you are right now. God is calling ministers who are young as well. But as we will see here, that comes with a lifestyle. It comes with an expected life. So when Timothy received these words from the Apostle Paul, he was most probably in his late 30s. So he was a young man. But this young man was called by God to be a minister in his church and was given authority to prescribe and to teach. God calls young men to ministry. But the congregation often makes it difficult, and I want to address the congregation as well. God calls young men to ministry. Often at times it is the congregation that makes it difficult for such ministers because of their age. By the way, as your minister, I think I stand above this youthfulness of Timothy. Praise God, I cut it. Okay? I'm two years above it. So I wouldn't be that young man anymore. But I realize that that means nothing. But what means everything is how one conducts himself as a minister of Christ. Because you can be minister of 60 years, you can be a minister of 35 years, if there is no life to beg your ministry, then you ought to be despised. That's what Paul is bringing out here. But I'm making a point to the congregation that often it is the congregation that makes it difficult for ministers. They despise them and treat them with contempt and as substandard ministers because of their age. Or you can even add to this because of whatever social status their ministers may have. But let me hasten to say that generally, churches tend to despise ministers whether they are young or old. And they do so because they do not want to be told how to live their lives. Isn't that true? Often ministers are despised because they prescribe and instruct. And because we don't want to hear that, we despise them. 
because they often touch where it hurts. But that's what ministers are called to do. See, Timothy was not the only one who was despised. Titus, his fellow minister who was not far from Timothy, and they were ministering around the same time, Titus was in creed. He faced the same contempt, not because he was young, although it is possible that he could have been, but the Bible doesn't tell us, but because he had to correct them. Listen to Titus chapter 2, verse 15. Paul encourages Titus with these words. These things, Titus, speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Do you hear what Paul tells Timothy and he tells Titus? That's what these two ministers were facing in their local churches. Disregarding them, despising them, treating them with Contempt. As I read these words, I was thinking of the Pharisees in, in John chapter 9. Remember the blind man who was born blind, and Jesus Christ opened his eyes. And now the Pharisees question that. How could he heal on the Sabbath? And they get a hold of this young man if he was young, but he's just called man because his parents would later say he is of age, meaning that he is full of age to be able to respond and answer the questions of the Pharisees. But there's one thing that catches attention in John 9, 34. After this man has told them some theology, this is what we know about God. He does not answer the prayer of a sinner. And we have never heard of any man who opened a man's eyes, especially one who was born blind. So how can you say this man is a sinner? And the Pharisees turn to him and say, you were born entirely in sin, and are you teaching us? And they kicked him out of the synagogue. That's often the attitude, even in the church. When the truth comes and it is prescribed, you get orders from God's word. Because it pains, often ministers are kicked out because of that. So I address that because those are some of the difficulties ministers, regardless of their age, face in the churches, especially churches that cannot stand God's word. How then can a young minister or any minister gain the respect of the church? And to the church, this is the question I want you to answer and what should the church look for in the minister? So double barrel question we need to answer this morning. How can a young man on his side gain the respect of the church? And on the other hand, how can the church, or what should the church look for in the minister? I'm going to suggest that you don't look for age, but you look for life and doctrine. Life and doctrine is what the Apostle Paul will tell us is to be looked at here. And we will see the answer to these questions in the eight exhortations that Paul gives in 1 Timothy verse, chapter 4, verse 12 to 16. But I want to summarize these eight exhortations under four headings or four qualities. There are four qualities of a respectable minister of Jesus Christ. And as I was preparing this sermon, I realized there was no way I can preach all of them here today. So we're going to look at the first one, only one today, the first respectable quality of a minister. And we will finish up the three next week. So the first one is in verse 12, and that is going to be our focus this morning. Verse 12. Let's read that text again. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. A respectable minister sets an example for believers. That's the quality of a respectable minister. If you are a minister and you are going to be respected, Paul says, show yourself an example. 
That exhortation is important. And let me also speak to the young people here. Young people, if you are going to earn any respect of the elders, of the adults that you may want to try and speak to influence, it is going to happen not because of your age, but because of your life. Set an example, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy. You see, the Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy, the onus is on you to offset the people, people's disrespect. It is dependent on you. Let no one disrespect you. So it is Timothy's responsibility to make sure that he is not disrespected. Now, he is not going to do this by demanding respect. Often people do that. I demand respect. I am a learned man. I come from a prestigious family. I have the degrees. I have this and this. You have to respect me. Do you know who laid hands on me? Those are often questions you get from young ministers who are arrogant. And such attitude will never earn you respect, but you will be disrespected for demanding respect. But also Timothy is not going to end this respect by acceding to people's demands. You see, often at times some ministers want to be people's pleasers, men pleasers. Timothy is not going to end this respect by being a man pleaser. That's not how he will offset the despise, the contempt, the disrespects. But Timothy was to overcome the youthful hindrances by being an example to those who believe. The word example from the Greek word tupos, where we get type, speaks of a pattern of life that Timothy is to set for believers. In other words, Timothy is to live a life that is worthy of respect. And how or what does that life look like? Now Paul helps Timothy in giving him five areas that Timothy has to work in. This, if Timothy was to take care of these five areas to work so that he becomes an example, he's saying to him, this is what's going to earn you respect. This is what will earn you the hearing from the church of God. So let's look at these five areas in which Timothy was to work hard so that he can earn the respect of the church. The first area is his speech. His speech. What comes out of his mouth. You see, foolish talk rightly attracts contempt. If you are a fool in your language, in your speech, then you can expect to be treated with contempt. You will be despised if you do not watch your words. Proverbs 18 verse 13 says that fools answer before hearing. And that's what happens. Timothy was to guard against that. It is only foolish to just open your mouth and speak before you have even heard what other people are saying. So if the advice was to be given to Timothy as a minister, it would be, Timothy, take time to listen. Be quick to hear and slow to speak, James says. So we are to guard our speech if we are going to earn any respect. And as I said, I want to address the young people. Young people, this is very crucial. This is a great discipline of life. is to learn to listen before you speak. So guard your words, guard your speech, otherwise you will be disrespected. An exemplary minister is a minister who speaks wholesome, edifying words. The opposite of wholesome is rottenness. So there should, a, a, an exemplary minister should not be marked by unwholesome or rotten words. Ephesians 4.29, the Apostle Paul says to the Ephesians, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. This will be a great example for Timothy if he learns to speak grace graciously, if he learns to know when to speak and when to be quiet. That's wisdom. 
and he speaks edifying and wholesome words. Let me repeat again that young people are often characterized by foolish and disrespectable language. If that is your problem, you know what I will, I, I, I will prescribe to you or suggest or recommend for you? Spend time in the book of Proverbs. You will gain wisdom and you will know how to speak. Pick the Bible and just go to Proverbs. This is what you can do. This is what I've done with my Bible. Is underline where the book of Proverbs talk about speech and listen to what it says. How you should speak and how you should not speak. And you will gain wisdom and you will gain respect as well. So wholesome words is what is required. Now to Timothy as a minister and to all the ministers here at CBC, here is what Paul also says in addressing speech. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 23 to 25, Paul tells Timothy, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. That's a great uh, prescription for a young man in ministry. That's a great advice. Do not be quarrelsome, Timothy, but be kind. Your speech should exhibit that kindness. You should be able to teach, and you teach with patience. Teach even those who have wronged you with great patience. Be gentle in the way that you are going to handle people. As you correct them, be gentle. That is earning respect. If Timothy was to do this, he was to earn respect. There is more that I think we can bring out here with regard to speech. But maybe we should summarize this or bring this to a close with these words. As Paul tells the deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3, not to be double-tongued. And that is what we are to guard against. Now this applies to every believer because Timothy is to set example for all believers. If this is who Timothy should be, all believers should be as well. What Timothy is to do is to show believers this is how you are to speak. And we are all to follow. So do not be found to be double-tongued. Someone who is not honest and consistent in their speech. If you want to earn respect, be honest and consistent in your speech. So that's the first quality that Timothy was to sharpen in his life or to work on in order to earn respect. Secondly is conduct. Moving from speech, we go to conduct. Often in the Bible, you will find speech and conduct together because they go to, together. The Bible tells us about how we are to guard our speech and our deeds. So to, they go together. Conduct. What do we mean by conduct? Conduct is a way of life. It is a behavior. And here for Timothy is a behavior of a minister. And we know that conduct involves what we do. It involves our deeds, our speaking, and our doing. Listen to what 1 Peter 2 verse 12 says about conduct. 1 Peter 2 verse 12 says, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. And Gentiles here refers to unbelievers. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. What do unbelievers see in us when they look at our conduct? You see, Timothy was to set example of his conduct, his behavior. They may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God. That should be our aim in life, is that my life should attract people to honor and glorify God. So if you were to go back again and look at the 
qualifications of leaders or elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we can summarize Timothy's life or every believer's life or any minister's life with these words. Timothy, you ought to be above reproach. You have to be above reproach, blameless. You shouldn't have any sticking accusations against you, Timothy. If you set example for believers in that, you will be able to prescribe and instruct and they will listen. So set an example in your conduct. Speech and conduct is what we are called to God. Number three is love. Love. We are setting exemplary lifestyle. What does an exemplary lifestyle look like in the church? It begins with a speech. It moves to how we behave, and now it comes to how we treat others in our love. Love, as we know from the Bible, is sacrificial. Love is not something that is actually looking that of its own, but it is always sacrificial. Love gives more than receiving. That's the nature of Bible, Bible's love. And from that classical passage on love in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 8, we know that love is patient, which tells you Timothy was to be an example of patience. If indeed love characterizes him, it will be shown by his patience with people. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Love does not behave dishonorably, or your translation might say unbecomingly. It's not dishonorable. Love does not seek its own, Timothy. Love is not provoked. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not hold grudges. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And we know, Timothy, love never fades. So that's the pattern of life Timothy is to set for believers. He is to be an example of the love we find in 1 Corinthians 13. Love, Bible writers tell us, is the summary of the law. Do you want to fulfill the law? Don't go around with the Ten Commandments trying to tick the boxes. Okay, you shall not worship other false gods. Tick. You shall keep the Sabbath. Tick. You shall honor your parents. Tick. Thou shall not covet. Tick. That's you will fail. Because the Bible says once you break one, you've broken them all. Which renders you a sinner and a failure before God. But how can you keep the commandments? The Bible says they are summarized in love. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength and everything. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. That is the summary of the law. So Timothy was to minister in love. He was to show believers what it means to love by loving them, by treating them with kindness and patience and love. I'm afraid that we live in a generation that is quite impatient, so unkind and so full of ourselves. And I'm not only talking to young people, but I'm also talking to each one of us. That's the, that's the generation we live in. We are very impatient with one another. That's unloving. We are called to actually be sacrificial, be willing to say, I will let it go and not hold it. Let's not always insist on being right, but let us insist on loving. Timothy was to do that. So he is to be example in his speech, in his conduct, in his love. And fourthly, the fourth quality he was to hone, he was to pay attention to, in order to be respectable, was faith. Faith. Now the word faith can be understood as faithfulness to what the minister is called to do. 
that's one possible understanding of this word faith, that he is faithful, and we know that that is required of ministers. Timothy says it is required of a steward that he be faithful. So that's part of being a minister. You want to have a faithful minister. If you are going to look for a minister in the church of God, you need to look for a minister who is faithful, who is loving, whose conduct is actually worthy of respect, his speech is honorable. So that's one possible way of looking at the word faith. Or it can be understood to mean trust. So Timothy either was to set example as a faith minister or in the way that he actually walks in his dependence upon the Lord and trusting him all the way. Either way, whether it's faithfulness or trust, a minister must be an example of both. Example of faithfulness to, the, to his task, and he should be an example of what it means to trust God. And given all the hardship of ministry that Timothy will face, he would need to be faithful in discharging his work, and he would need to depend upon God when ministry becomes unbearable. Because you will need, you, a ministers are tested through those times of hardship when he labors as a soldier or when he, he, he discharges his duties as a soldier or labor, hardworking labor of a farmer or an athlete exercise, as we see this in 2 Timothy 2. Those are the metaphors used for a minister. It is hard. He is in a fight. He will be an example in a way that he continues to trust God during that hardship. But let me remind you that prerequisite to being faithful or trusting God is faith in God. It starts there. Paul could not tell Timothy to do what he is not. First, you have to be in Christ to be faithful and to trust him daily. And that's what Timothy, Paul tells Timothy in chapter 1, verse 2. He writes to him, to Timothy, my true child, in the faith. And that's where Timothy was. He was in the faith. He had trusted Jesus. And that's a prerequisite, by the way, even to speech, to conduct, to how we are going to love, and to how we are going to move in our faithfulness. We should have placed our faith in Jesus first. Otherwise, you're going to labor in your own strength and you will fail. It is only those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. It is those who hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, 1 Timothy 3, 9, who will be able to develop in these qualities. If this is not true of you, then you will be starting in a wrong place. Don't live here and try to start with your speech and your conduct and your love and your faith. You will fail. But start with faith in Jesus Christ. Start with what we, we saw this morning when we were partaking of the Lord's Supper, thinking of what Jesus Christ has done. Psalm 32 that was read this morning. Blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven and they are not counted against him. If you have that blessing, then you will have the joy of developing these qualities. But if your sins are not forgiven and you haven't come to the cross of Jesus Christ to bow your knee before him, trying to hone your speech so that you can be respected, trying to take care of your outside behavior and so on. Yes, it will work somehow, but it will just be wax and it will not get anywhere. It will not take you to heaven. It is starting with Christ. And once we are in Christ, we know that this is actually the life of Christ. All these qualities here, if you want to learn and know them perfectly, look to Jesus Christ. You want to know what, how to speak? Go to Jesus Christ. You want to know how to conduct yourself? You come to Jesus Christ because that's where you're going to learn this. You need to know what love is. Look to the cross and see what love is. Greater love has no one than this, that one should lay his life for his friends. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
You want to know what it means to be faithful and to trust God? Look to Jesus Christ because he trusted his father to the end, to the cross, to the grave, into resurrection and ascension in heaven. So Jesus is ultimately the one who can enable us to develop these qualities. So lastly, it's purity. Purity. Timothy is to be example, to show himself an example of believers in purity. Now, in this text, although purity can encompass a broader scope of life, it seems in this context, Paul has in mind sexual purity. And Paul knew that Timothy, as a young man, is not immune to youthful lusts. And that's what we know young people struggle with. I'm not saying older people don't, but young people, the greatest challenge of every young man is going to be these sinful and youthful lusts. Timothy had to go through the same things. And Paul warns Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 20 to 22. He says to him, Now, Timothy, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Those are the earthenware vessels found in the house of God. Some will be used for honor and some will be used for dishonor. And he says to him, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now he says this in verse 22. Listen to Paul telling Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 verse 22. And uh, if you a young man here, you want to memorize this verse. This is, one of, this is one of the verses that I grew up with as a young man. And I always called a quadruple two. Two, 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 two. You will remember that, right? Second Timothy 2.22. Two, 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 two. What does it say? Flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. This is what young men should pursue. It is purity, and mainly sexual purity, to be specific. And listen to what Paul again advises Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> Especially when he is speaking about how Timothy is to treat young women in the church. Verse 2, Paul says to Timothy, Younger women, Timothy, treat them as sisters in all purity. The exact same word that Paul uses here in 1 Timothy 4. Treat younger women as sisters in all purity. Young men, let me speak to you directly as well this morning that the Bible still says sex before marriage is sin. Let that sink. Sex before marriage is sin, and it destroys your reputation, your life, and it becomes so hard to recover from that sin. I want to urge you this morning, in that age where you are now, to guard your purity. I almost wanted to say with all that you have, but you cannot. You cannot guard your purity with all that you have. But I want to say this to you, that every time you face that temptation, you face that lure towards impurity, sexual impurity, call to Jesus Christ with all that you have. Because there, that's where you'll find protection. I know you are exposed to that. So the Bible speaks 
of young men setting example for others in purity. And that's what God is calling us to here this morning. So this applies to everyone, specifically to young ministers, but more generally to all the young people. No one is excluded from these five qualities. We all need to work on these qualities as believers. So as we live here, we're going to look at it and say, how am I doing in my speech? Is it honorable? We live here and say, how is my conduct? How is my behavior? How are my deeds? Will it attract unbelievers to give glory to God? How is my love? How do I treat others? Am I kind, patient, long-suffering? How about my faith? Is it alive? Do I show within my daily walk that indeed I have trusted the Lord? Is my life dependable upon Him? And lastly, how is my purity? And not just in acts, but also in thoughts. How is my purity in heart as well? That's what the Bible calls us to. If we are going to be examples, we need these qualities. So, Church family, if a young man shows himself an example in these five areas, this is what you should do. You must respect him and allow him to give you biblical orders and instruction. If God raises up young men in this church as ministers and they prove to be examples, they must be respected and they should be afforded a hearing because they are called to teach God's word in the church. So this young man will have the authority uh, to speak, to exhort, and to reprove. And that was what God calls pastors to do. So we stand before you as well, as pastors in this church, knowing that this is the kind of life we ought to live. And this is the standard I know you should be expecting from us. So if you are going to judge, this should be the standard, the standard of God's word. I pray that this will begin to sharpen us in terms of how we are to conduct ourselves as well in the household of God. Remember, that's the goal. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that as you build your church, you also tell us what your church should be like. The church ministers, even those who may be despised because of their age, you still tell us how they can earn respect. And Lord, I pray that the goal will not be to appear cool, as often young people say, but that the goal will be to honor Christ and make him known. For the way we conduct ourselves, it's the way that people will judge the Savior we serve. Your word says that a light should shine before men so that they may see our good, death, good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. I pray that we will take those kinds of instructions from God's word seriously. Because we know if we don't, the Bible and its message will be maligned because we claim to believe it. So I pray that your spirit will transform us and make us like Christ. For all that we have read about today is only possible in Christ. So we pray not only for salvation for those who are not saved, but for sanctification for believers who are struggling. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.